Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number eight of the Homestead Journey podcast. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the homesteading journey. I hope this finds you well. If your house is anything like our house, right now you probably are finding yourself in the middle of, well, the Christmas rush. <laughs> Shopping and Christmas parties and Christmas get-togethers and Christmas concerts and all of those kinds of things. And so I do thank you so much for taking time out of this busy time of year to uh, listen to me ramble on <laughs> about homesteading. Let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happening segment. Here on 3B Farm and Homestead, on one hand, well, a whole lot hasn't been going on here simply because of the time of year with us kind of getting ready for the holidays and Christmas parties and rushing around trying to get presents purchased and all of that. Um, and then the other thing has been the weather. It, it's been a, a, a crappy week <laughs> weather-wise. Uh, it, it's warmed up, but it's kind of been raining and misty and kind of almost that mud season temperature. And so everything right now is really, really muddy and kind of nasty. Uh, and so that really hasn't lent itself well to being outdoors and getting much of anything done. But I did get a few things done on the homestead this week. The first thing that I got done this week is I reunited the boar and the two sows. Uh, reunited and it feels so good. Yes, it is that time of year when uh, I try to get the boars and the sow, the sows uh, together because I'm shooting for litters somewhere in the April to May time frame. And usually I've waited until the 1st of January to put them together. But last year uh, when I did that, I ended up with a litter that was right on the cutoff as far as when we can show these animals for the fair. And so I didn't want to uh, put myself in that situation again. And so I added a few weeks to it. So about three weeks earlier than I did last year. We'll see how things um, kind of flesh out from that. But my goal, <laughs> we'll see whether or not Mother Nature cooperates, but my goal is to have the litters in the April-ish time frame when it's not too cold, it's not too hot, and um, so we'll see how things things shake out this year. Last year, I actually had a litter that was born in December, and I really, really would like to avoid those litters in the cold weather because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to have to be putting heat lamps and, and all of that kind of stuff out there if I can avoid it. So that was the first uh, major thing that we did this week here on the homestead. And then today I spent quite a bit of time. It had, you know, it's, like I said, it was kind of warm. It wasn't misting and raining as much today. And so I spent some time doing uh, some clean out. I actually cleaned out the uh, hoop coop. Um, I wanted to do that in the fall and just didn't get around to doing that. And so I was able to get that cleaned out and get fresh uh, chips put down in there. It's the winter run that I... I use for my egg layers and uh, then I got some wood chips and, and so forth uh, down to the pigs and in with the geese and got some more leaves in with the chickens to kind of scratch around in and uh, so that was kind of my big task today on the homestead but other than that you know things here are a little bit slower and so hopefully this week I will get my pig back that I took to the processor last week and then uh, we'll be enjoying some fresh sausage and pork and bacon and all of those good things. All right, let's jump on over to this episode's Community Corner. This week, uh, Justin Rhodes has been releasing a series of videos with regards to their 
story and their journey into the homesteading lifestyle. And I've really, really been enjoying that. You know, I really enjoy hearing people's story. I enjoy hearing the journey uh, that has kind of brought people to homesteading. And not only do I find enjoyment in that, but I think that it's important for each individual or each couple, each family to somehow document that journey. And so on this Community Corner, I want to talk a little bit about that. And I, I want to offer maybe a bit of encouragement and also maybe a word of caution with regards to documenting your homestead journey and also enjoying and listening to other people's story as well. Why do I think that it's important to document your homestead journey? Well, there's a number of reasons why I think it's it's important. First of all, I think it's important simply because it's going to give your kids and your grandkids kind of a, well, a window into your life and an understanding as far as why you have chosen to live your life the way that you have. And well, right now, maybe your kids or your grandkids uh, that are yet to be born, <laughs> they may have no interest in that. But trust me, there's going to come a day uh, when when they are going to find interest in that. And quite frankly, I, I have kicked myself many, many times that I did not sit down with my grandfather and ask him more questions and document his journey um, better than what I did. And so I, I think that's a, an important component of this. The second reason why I think it's important for you to somehow document your journey is because I think that it is something that periodically it's good to go back and to, to review and to think about. Um, it's going to help refocus your, you know, your, your journey forward. And sometimes it's easy to become derailed or to maybe lose uh, sight of why you do what you do. Sometimes it's it's easy to maybe become discouraged or to see what other people are doing and feel that maybe what you're doing isn't good enough. And so for you to come back and to review or, or, or to kind of once again think about your journey and and how you've arrived to this point, I think is is something that can be very helpful uh, from that standpoint. The, the final reason why I think that it, it can be helpful to document your journey somehow is because I think it can serve as an inspiration to other people. And it can help other people and encourage other people on their homesteading journey. Now when I talk about documenting your homesteading journey, it could be like I did in episode one and just share with people via a podcast. Or it could be simply writing it down. And, and maybe you don't share it with anybody else, but you have that written in a journal somewhere. It could be shooting a video. It could be a blog post. There's a myriad of different ways in which you can document your homesteading journey. But I think it's something that to share that journey uh, at least with your yourself, your future self, <laughs> but but maybe with your kids, your grandkids, with your friends, uh, with with other people in the broader homesteading community. I think it's something that can be very important. It can be very beneficial. It can be very encouraging. But my word of caution is also that when you are listening to other people's stories, just keep in mind that. They are their stories. And while we can certainly draw inspiration from other people, we need to remember that we're on our journey. My journey is not Justin Rhodes' journey. Their story is a beautiful story, and I've enjoyed getting to know them a little bit better this week. But that's not my story. That's not my journey. And, and so I need to keep that in mind. I, and that's why I think that it's very important for us to kind of document our journey so that we can refer back to it. We can understand where we are and what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing and, and to kind of refocus ourselves on what's important to us. The things that are important to Justin Rhodes are not things that are necessarily important to me and that's okay. And the things that are important to you may not be necessarily important to me and that's okay. And the things that are important to me may not necessarily ring a bell with you and that's all good. Because remember, it's about a journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. 
It's not about necessarily the things that we do. It's not about the what's per se, but it's about the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, sustainability, and how that plays out in each one of our homesteading journey. It, it's going to look different and that's okay. But I think that somehow documenting that, sharing that with other people, if you, if you feel comfortable in doing so, I, I think is, is something that can be very, very beneficial to you, to your family, and to the broader homesteading community. If you're so inclined, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear your journey. I'd love to hear how it is that you've arrived at where you're at today and, and kind of where you envision yourself going. So if you feel comfortable sharing that with me, uh, shoot me an email, the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you uh, jump on over to Facebook, we have a Facebook page there. You can always send me a message or make a post there. I would absolutely love to hear your story. And quite frankly, if you want me to share it with other people, I'd be happy to do that as well. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump into this week's charting the course. Now we are in, well, we're coming towards the end of our gardening series. This is episode number four in a five part gardening series. So we started this back in episode number five when we tried to at least help you answer the question, what gardening method should I use? So hopefully by now you've made a determination, a decision, with regards to how you plan to approach gardening in the coming growing season. On episode number six, we spent some time talking about harvest preparation, preparing for the harvest, thinking about what we're going to do with the vegetables we're going to grow and how that can help us understand what to plant, when to plant, and how much to plant. In episode number seven, which was our last episode, we spent some time talking about getting seeds. Where should I get my seeds? And I talked about a number of different ways that you can acquire seeds and also some of the ways that I have acquired seeds throughout the year. On this episode, I want to spend some time talking about transplants. And in particular, I hope to help you answer the question, should I buy or should I start my own transplant? But before we go there, let's just kind of go back to the beginning, so to speak. Um, if you are new to gardening, you may not be aware that there are different approaches you may want to take with certain vegetables. There are certain vegetables that you are always going to want to direct sow. Now what direct sowing means or direct seeding means is that you are going to plant the seed in the place in your garden from which you anticipate harvesting that vegetable. You're not going to move it, you're not going to relocate it, but you're going to sow the seed into the ground, thus the name direct sow, direct seeding, and then you are going to hopefully, if everything goes well, you're going to achieve an abundant harvest from that spot. And some vegetables that you're always going to want to direct sow would be things like beans and peas and uh, your root, root vegetables, your beets and your carrots, your rutabagas, your parsnips, and uh, those kinds of things. Now there are some seeds that you're almost always going to want to start indoors in a cold frame at a greenhouse. And then as seedlings, you're going to want to move them out into your garden. That would be things like peppers and tomatoes and some of your brassicas like your cabbages and your um, Brussels sprouts and things of that sort. Then there are some vegetables that can kind of go either way and it kind of depends on your situation as to whether or not you might want to direct sow them or you might want to start them indoors from seed uh, and then transplant them out into your garden at a later date. Vegetables that fall into this category would be things like your cucumbers, your melons, your squashes, so winter squash, summer squash, your zucchinis, um, herbs. There's just a variety of vegetables like that that sometimes you may want to direct sow and sometimes you may want to sow indoors and then transplant later on. 
And some of the reasons why you might want to consider that is that you may want to get a an early jump on the growing season. So here in the Northeast, our growing season is rather short. And so if I start, uh, let's say my um, cucumbers indoors uh, a couple of weeks early, then I've got that much of a jump on the growing season. And so I may be able to get cucumbers earlier. Uh, or what I could do is by starting those cucumbers early and then transplanting them out into the, uh, into the garden and then planting some more direct sowing some, then now what I have is a, I have a harvest that is going to be continuous throughout the growing season. Another reason why I might want to do that is I may have a spring crop that I have planted in a particular location in my garden. So let's say I plant some spinach in the spring and then what I want to do is I want to follow that with a squash of some sort. But I, because my growing season is so short here, in order to ensure that I'm going to be able to meet the number of days to harvest, if I start that vegetable indoors, let's say a squash, and then transplant it into where the spinach was, I now can ensure that I'm going to get a harvest because I don't have to wait for the seed to germinate out in the garden. So there are sometimes it's just a matter of trying to get as much as much of a harvest from a particular piece of ground as I possibly can through some succession planning. And the way that I can kind of speed up that process is by starting those seeds indoors and then relocating them, transplanting them uh, later on. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to transplant. You may have to transplant, again, depending on if you're doing peppers and, and tomatoes and things like that. And so then the question comes, should I buy the transplants or should I start them myself? And quite frankly, I don't think there's a right answer for everybody. Now, there are some people who say, well, you should always start your own vegetables. I, I disagree with that. Um, we all lead busy lives and some people simply don't have time to dedicate to starting plants indoors. Some people don't have the infrastructure in place. You're new to gardening, you don't have a grow light system. And you don't have to have a complicated system. You, you don't. But you may not have the time or energy or the finances to dedicate even to the simple things. And you want to take that money and put it into your outdoor garden space. Um, you may decide that you don't want to mess around with hardening off plants. Uh, transplants. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So there's a lot of reasons why people may decide that they need to uh, to buy the transplants. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you any less of a homesteader <laughs> if you buy your transplants, okay? But let's just talk about some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks to both approaches. So um, a benefit to buying transplants is, again, the convenience factor. You go down to the store, you pick out the transplants you want, you walk out after paying, of course, <laughs> you uh, bring them home and you drop them in your garden, bada bing, bada boom, you're on your way. Uh, you haven't had to fuss around with it for six weeks and make sure that your growing conditions are correct and that your soil temperature is correct and that everything has been watered and, and, and the light has been correct and all you haven't messed around with it. Very convenient. You go down, you buy it, you bring it home, you put it in the ground, boom, done. Another reason why you may want to uh, buy the transplants is because they have been hardened off by, well, I'm going to use huge air quotes here, but by professionals and not hardening off is, is a term that we, we use with regards to transplants that simply says that I have acclimated this small seedling from the protective cocoon in which it's been nurtured for all of this time. You know, we've given it the ideal amount of light. We've given it the ideal amount of moisture. We've given it the ideal amount of, uh, of heat. Now we're going to put it outside and the winds are going to batter it. The sun is going to do what it wills. It's going to rain or not rain. It's going to be facing, you know, not that ideal cocoon that it's been living in, in my grow light system or in my greenhouse. And so we've got to acclimate this 
seedling to life outdoors, and that's called hardening off. And it's not something that's very difficult. There's a it, there's a, a process by which you can do that, but if you are living a busy life and you are extremely busy at work or you're running kids all over, you may just not have time to monkey around with hardening off the plants. And so if you buy your transplants, you know that they have been hardened off, they've been acclimated, and they should be ready to go outdoors. Another reason why you may want to go ahead and buy your transplants is by and large when people are starting transplants in your area. Those are not going to generally speaking, are not going to be coming from far off places. They're going to have been started by a greenhouse somewhere in your area. And the people that have started them off are going to have put some thought into the varieties that they have chosen. And these transplants should be adapted well for your area. Now, what are some reasons why you might not want to buy transplants? Well, Buying transplants can be rather expensive. You can buy, let's say, a pack of tomato seeds for $249. I don't know what the going rate is, but let's say $249, you buy a pack of tomato seeds, and that pack of tomato seeds could have 60 seeds in it. I don't know. I haven't looked lately at my catalog. I should have done that before I did this podcast, but let's just say it's got 60 seeds in it, and you're getting it for $249. Now, you go down and buy transplants. Well, a flat of six could cost you $249. And then if you want to buy them a little larger, so maybe you buy them in a three inch pot, that could cost you $250 by itself. And then you want to buy a four inch pot, which is one that's a little farther on even still, and that might cost you four bucks. So you can see that those costs add up quite quickly buying transplants. Now, certainly, if you're going to invest in a greenhouse or in, an, in a fancy grow light system, you're going to incur costs there. But over time, you are going to save money by starting your own transplants. Another reason why you may want to start your own transplants is because uh, you have then access to an incredible variety of tomatoes and peppers and squashes and this, that, and the other thing. If you go down to your big box store, you're probably going to have uh, a few hybrid variety tomatoes. You're, you may have a couple of heirlooms, maybe a couple of paste tomatoes, um, some plum tomatoes, and some cherry tomatoes. And when it's all said and done, you may have, if you're lucky, you may have 15 varieties to choose from. Whereas if you look at a current seed catalog, many of them have hundreds of varieties of seeds uh, that you can choose from. And even if you go to a farmer's market and you decide you want to go to the farmer's market and get your seeds there, your, your transplants there. And I have a friend from church. In fact, she has been listening to this podcast. So a shout out to you, Debbie, um, who does that. She, in the spring, she will start uh, tomatoes and take them to the farmer's market and she sells them. And she focuses on heirloom varieties. That's what she takes. That's what she sells. But even still, she is only going to have 10 or 15 varieties. She's not going to have 100 varieties that it would make no sense for her to do that. And so certainly if someone decided that they wanted variety XYZ, their, their only option may be to order that seed through the mail and start it because they're not going to find that at the local greenhouse. They're not going to find that at the local farmer's market. They're not going to find that at Lowe's or Home Depot. You're going to have to start it yourself. Another reason why you may want to start your own transplants is because what better way to live a life that is self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable than by saving seeds and then the next year starting those seeds uh, from scratch and, you know, kind of going through that whole process. Now you don't need to rely on anybody, but if you're making your own compost, you could use that as your growing medium and you could do very, very well by saving seed, starting seed, and, and, and going through that whole process. What better way to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, and sustainable than by doing that? 
The final reason why you may want to start your own transplants is because depending on your approach to gardening uh, and what you're, you know, again, what you're trying to do, you may not have transplants available to you when you need them. So if you're going to maybe hold off and, and wait to plant your broccoli or your Brussels sprouts later on in the season uh, so that they're coming um, to maturity during the fall and maybe you get a, a frost or two on them to help sweeten them up. If you're going to wait, those transplants probably are not going to be sold at your Lowe's, Home Depot, your big box stores, your farmer's market, your local greenhouse. They're going to have been sold out from a long time ago uh, and have moved on to other seasons. And so if you want to be able to have those approaches and really have great control over the timing as far as when you transplant those vegetables into your garden, you're certainly going to want to start those seeds on your own. There's benefits and drawbacks either way you go. Um, but don't let anybody tell you that in order to be a real homesteader, you have to start your own transplants. That's absolute hogwash. My grandfather had beautiful gardens for years and years and years. And I don't know, maybe when I was really young, he started his own tomatoes and peppers and so on and so forth. But by the time I rolled around, uh, and I took interest in what was going on. He was buying all of his transplants, planting them in the garden. He harvested many, many um, bushels, probably tons of vegetables from his gardens, preserved them. We ate well, uh, and uh, he was buying his transplants. So it's certainly a viable option. Um, there's just benefits and drawbacks either way you go. All right, that's it for this week's Charting the Course. Next week, we're going to be wrapping up our series on gardening. We're going to be talking about dealing with pests and weeds in your garden. Hopefully, you will find that very helpful. But let's go ahead and jump on over to this week's homestead hack. This week's homestead hack is a gardening hack. And in particular, it is geared towards those who use square foot gardening as their methodology. And in particular, if you use a raised bed for square foot gardening. So in square foot gardening, you plant by the square foot, hence the name. And one of the things that Mel Bartholomew recommends is that you put a grid on your garden. And that is something that I have really struggled with uh, since I've been doing square foot gardening now for almost 10 years. But I have really struggled with coming up with a well, a workable grid that um, is cost effective and easy to put together. When I first started out, I actually got some of that um, wooden lath from uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, and I actually made grids using that. I actually screwed it together, and those did not last very long at all. They rotted, and they might have lasted one or two seasons. So then I got some of that vinyl, um, I think it's like a vinyl trim, and I made grids out of that, and I actually made four by four grids and used them in my garden, and those lasted for several seasons, but again, they were, they were difficult to put together. When I say difficult to put together, it's not they were hard, it was just time consuming, it was kind of a pain in the butt, and that vinyl trim really wasn't optimized for being out in in the sun, and so the UV rays broke it down, and over time it became brittle, and those just started to fall apart. And then I discovered a really, really easy way to set up my grids, and that simply was I went down the side of my uh, raised beds, and at every foot I put a screw, and I just left that screw up about, oh, between a, a quarter of an inch and a half inch up in the air, and then what I do is I use baling twine and I just tie it from one side to the other and just tie it off until I have the lines going from side to side. And then I do the same from end to end. And then bam, I have my grid. And one of the things that I have an abundance of right now on the homestead is baling twine. So it didn't cost me anything to do this. But if you don't have a lot of baling twine around, 
you could get a roll of butcher's twine, uh, nylon, rope, I mean anything like that and it's just simply you're tying from one screw to the other uh, from side to side and then from end to end and then you have a very very nice grid set up very easy and relatively inexpensive and can be totally cheap and free um, if you're using baling twine like I do. If you've enjoyed what you've heard or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.